Let me take you back in time. We are 2,000 years back, still three meters below ground, actually more now. And this is the living room of one of the wealthy of Jerusalem. Let me show you my living room. Look at the furniture, stone tables, stone vessels. Look at the fancy mosaic floors, right? At the stone tables, the rounded ones. Follow me and see over here how the walls were decorated. Over here with multicolored fresco. Multicolored fresco over there. It's the, the, the top fashion of the day. We're talking about the year 68 of the Common Era. Things like this were found in Italy, in Pompeii, right? Also over here, you got it lit up, right? There's also a drain here, which brings water, dirty water, used water, from a different house and brings it further out towards a slope where it will leave the city. We'll come back to this pipe here in a few moments. Follow me this way now. If this was my living room, Maybe over there, a storage area with the amphories, with the wine containers. Come and look at my dishes. Come and look at my dishes. The rich and famous in Jerusalem only used the very best. This is Nabataean pottery. It is very thin, extremely breakable. Look how nicely it is decorated. Only the wealthiest of wealthy had these type of dishes. And then turn around and look at the stone vessels. Look at the stone vessels that we have over here. Try to focus, for example, on this elaborate tray, a serving tray made from stone. Measuring cups, or maybe there were beer cups. Storage vessels for grain, maybe for some cooked dish. Even a cooking pot. Look at the craftsmanship of the handle of the cover. It looks like a crock pot for children. Absolutely. And look over here in the next gallery. In the next gallery, we got some vases and maybe inkwells, all made from stone. And over here, measuring weights and over there maybe some sort of figures to play a game or maybe um, corkscrews corks stone corks right corks right this square implement might have been a portable stove that is mentioned in the Gemara by uh, named Kupach some people suggest this and down here, sundial. In the middle is a sundial. To the right is a smaller sundial. You gotta know your time, right? And a um, mortar. Most of the stone vessels are made from the local Jerusalem stone. The mortar is made from Galilean basalt rock, because it has to be strong and hard, that's a tool. But most of this is soft Jerusalem stone. How do you produce this? All this was found in this mansion. All this was found here in this excavation here. 
this mansion, this wealthy man owned all these vessels and they were found in this home. Absolutely. Here, three meters below. More than three meters. Here we're more than below, like three and a half meters, actually almost below meters. Level. Right. Now, realize what do you need to produce this? All you need is a block, a chunk of rock, and the Jerusalem stone is fairly soft, soft limestone. A hammer and a chisel, and you shape the, the, the vessel. It has to, you have to know how to do it, right? And then you polish it, and that's it. It's a very simple type of process. If you compare that to our pottery vessels over here, over here, you need a lot more effort. You gotta first get the clay. You have to make sure that the clay is pure. So you may have to actually cleanse it from other sediments inside. Then you have to make sure that that clay remains wet. Then you have to shape it, right? With your hands and on a uh, potter's wheel. And after it is shaped, you're gonna then decorate it with um, special tools uh, to engrave it with uh, all kinds of grooves. Then you're going to let it dry. And after it's dry, then you're gonna decorate it with paint, with drawings. You gotta know how to draw. You have to have the paint, the, br the paintbrush, the, uh, the uh, sophistication of knowing how to paint this. And then you still have to put it into a furnace and fire it at the right temperature for the right amount of time. And these things get fired at something like 600 to 800 degrees Celsius, right? There is a lot of effort that goes into producing earthenware vessels. There is a lot less effort into producing stone vessels. Stone vessels, according to our sages, are not susceptible to ritual impurity. These vessels, the pottery vessels, are very susceptible to ritual purity. The only way to purify this is to break it. That's the only way, which means basically it's gone. No way to purify it. Because so much effort went into it. We see here the laws of Tumantara, which are very intricate. Right? The laws of Tumantara give us something of an understanding. The more investment of us humans, the more susceptible to fallacy, to ritual impurity it can be. It will be, right? The less investment, the more simple, in that sense, of the material and of the craft, craftsmanship, no tumor. It goes that far that vessels made from dung, which is the simplest material, right? It's a bit hard for us to imagine a dung vessel, but I guess they weren't used for putting your moist food in there, maybe just for storage, storing, you know, dry stuff. Vessels from dung, just take it, shape it, let it dry in the sun. That's it. No tumor whatsoever. So we have here something very unique. But you look at these stone vessels. This is not simple stuff. This is fancy stuff. You know, we saw that the, 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 the pottery was very fancy. But look at the fanciness of, of the decoration, the tray, right? right? It has these borders, the beautiful handles. Um, if we go now towards, we swing around, we swing around to, to look just this way one more time into the living room from our angle here, and we see that people used stone furniture. That was unique. Why use stone furniture? So stones we have readily available here, but stone is not macabre tumor. It doesn't become tummy. So it's clear the combination of Macabal tumor means to become ritually impure. It does not receive. It does not ritual receive. Impurity. It does not receive ritual impurity. But what does? The uh, the fancy um, earthenware. Earthenware. Not only also unfancy earthenware. Earthenware is macabre tumor big time. So earthenware does receive and right. can be susceptible to ritual impurity, spiritual impurity, having t been touched by either a dead body or a rodent. Right. Right? Or a dead rodent. Right? Or a dead rodent. Right? So, so we have here this combination of fancy stone vessels, lots of them. We have mikvahs. We saw a mikvah and a bath over there. There will be more mikvahs down there. 
Every house here had its own mikveh. And we see that the vessels are made very, very fancily. Let me show you the most fancy vessel that they found here. Come on with me. You see over here, there's a glass bowl. This is just the far cry of what they found here. Come and I'll show you another one. You look over here. See over here? Focus on it. This is sitting in the Israel Museum. You know why it is? It was found here. This is a designer piece. This is like, you know, the Rosenthal, um, you know, uh, porcelain of their days made from glass. It's some sort of a vase, beautifully decorated. It has the insignia of the craftsman. He was known throughout the entire Mediterranean basin. They found glass vessels of his in other parts of the Mediterranean area, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Turkey, in Greece. His name was Inon from Sidon. Folks, if Inon from Sidon had glass vessels here in this living room, or in this dining room here, the person who lived here 2,000 years ago, including the year 68 of the Common Era, two years or a year and a half before the destruction of the Holy Temple, must have been a very wealthy person. There are people who suggest that the Hashmonaim, part of the Hashmonai clan, lived over here. If you follow me here further, you can see a little bit more. Chambers. Maybe I'll go inside and you'll follow me with the camera. This was like a large living room with smaller rooms on the side. And if you want to come down, you want to come down here because there's what to see here. You can see the wall decorations. Look, this is the fresco without color, right? It's just plaster decorated with geometrical shapes which make it look like it is built from ashlars. And then look over here. You can see inside here The painted fresco that we saw earlier higher up in a different chamber, right? But you see it's poked full with, you know, like damage. That is purposely damaged because the people here were so wealthy they were going to change the decoration. How are you going to change the decoration? You have two, two ways of doing that. Either you scrape off the entire thing, which is a messy job, or you make it just rugged and rough and you put a thin layer of new plaster over it and that one you can paint again or decorate again as you wish. As you can see here, you can see here there's layers upon layers of wall decorations. It's true your room gets a tiny bit smaller, right? But I guess that wasn't so crucial to the people in those days. And maybe one more thing we can see over here. Not only were the walls decorated fancy, but also the ceiling. How do we know? Because they found broken pieces of the ceiling laying on the ground here. And here we have some more of their vessels, right? Some of the, uh, some of the uh, more personal items, uh, makeup items, right? Little makeup spoons and little, little, um, um, containers for, uh, for makeup, um, little inkwells and uh, oil lamps. You see how fancy they are, 
how nicely they're decorated, right? Perfume bottles, right? But if you look at the ceiling, look at the ceiling. They made a fake ceiling. Just take the lit up area here, right? And then look, where did they get the idea from? Where did they get the idea, the reconstruction here? What, how did they, the restorers, how did they get the idea to make it like this? Because they found on the ground these broken parts here, which gave them an idea this must have come down from the ceiling. This was a wealthy house. We call it Beit Hamidot, the, house, the mansion of dimensions, right? Lots of mikvahs. There's more mikvahs underneath us here. Lots of fancy dishes. Stoneware that is not simple stoneware. It is fancy stoneware. Glass vessels. Inon from Sidon. The richest stuff that you can get in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. It is clear that wealthy people lived here. The fact that they had lots of mikvahs indicates to us that they kept the laws of Tuma and Tara very meticulously. In those days, you could have your private mikvah in your house, but not everybody did. But these people had more than one private mikvah in the house, right? It's very fair to assume that this was the home of priests, of wealthy priests, and perhaps even of a branch of the Hasmonean clan.